Great. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Uh, I apologize because I'm going to run through this quickly, and I know that some people are listening in a second language. So I will try to be very articulate. Um, what I think is interesting about doing any of this, so you all know that I'm from Stevens College. This is our motto, write, reach, represent. So we're all about writing, and, and for me, it's about reaching different people, and my program's about women, and um, bringing more women into the this is all stuff about me. Oh, except I will say I'm the book review editor for the Journal of Screenwriting. So if you have a book or you want to be a book reviewer, please see me because we need more, right? That's always important. Um, so a funny thing happened to me on the way to doing this presentation. I didn't find the research that I was looking for. Um, maybe I didn't have time. I was starting with the idea that I've done a lot of work on Francis and Albert Hackett. And in The Thin Man, they made Nora very smart. She is a smart character. She is not necessarily in Hammett's novel. He says he created her simply to not write a love story. So he gave his detective a wife. He didn't think about agency or anything interesting with her. But Francis Hackett did. The problem is when they get to the fourth film, it's not written by Francis and Albert anymore. It's written by a team of men. Love men, married to a man, my son, right? Love men, however, they don't always consider what they're doing to female characters. And in this case, they made her ditzy. And they thought that was funny. And I hated to see a female character who started out here and, and was brought lower than she should be. So I wanted to find more of that, right? It's Frances who gave Nora her smarts. She would always say she would fight for the female character because no other woman was in the room. That's still often true today. Problem is, these guys took that away just for the joke. And we used to say on the different TV shows I've been on, never destroy a character for the sake of a joke because you can't get the character back. And so this was really interesting to me. Uh, a couple years ago, I did a whole thing on the TV show Gidget and how when females wrote Gidget, she was smart. When men wrote her, um, as far as courtesies and respect are concerned, if I, a boy meets me halfway, it's good enough. That's not what a woman would write, right? That's what a male writer wrote. Whereas a woman wrote something much stronger about female friendships and relationships. So I was really going to look into that and give you a whole set of those things. And nothing else came up or I didn't have time. So thankfully, Jan slotted me in this Words Matter panel. And this is a slide I use for my students. I believe that words matter equally, if not more than the action, actually, um, and that women writers' words matter. And we don't often teach a lot of them. So I thought, well, here's my opportunity to flood you with some really amazing women who wrote some amazing things. And when I thought about words matter, it reminded me that about 10 or 15 years ago, the Writers Guild did a advertising campaign to remind people that movies belong to the writers. They don't belong to the directors. So these billboards were all over Los Angeles. And it reminded people that these were lines you remember. It's not shots that you necessarily remember when you talk about your favorite film. So I love that. And then actually my husband started doing these for me on my website, taking lines from female written films. Again, to stress that's what my program's about in Los Angeles. And we just kept flooding the internet with these. And now the women in the Committee for Women Writers at the Guild are doing this on their own websites. So we're all trying to push this idea that the words matter. So I thought, let me present to you a bunch of women who we should be teaching, we should remember and know in our classes. And from the beginning of films, we start with Anita Luce, who actually got her job because she wrote excellent intertitles. And directors at the time said, nobody cares about those. Nobody can read those. The, the society's illiterate. But hers were so good that they made it on screen, and they got better and better. And she actually saved Intolerance, which was a large, too much action, too much filming. It was a piece of trash. Uh, and, and she fixed it by putting in inner titles that gave some sense to the story. So she's quite important. She was also brought in to salvage redheaded woman. Uh, nobody could figure out how to make a movie about a female anti-hero who, who cheats to get someone else's husband and then cheats on him. Right? And that was like, oh, terrible, bad woman. How could you make her interesting? And Anita Luce made her interesting, but she also injected, and I'm going to see this in several of the women that I mentioned, she injected her own philosophy. And I think that's what makes a piece of dialogue strong and powerful. She was married to a man who cheated on her, right? And so she's thinking about what mattered in her life, of course, was what is real love. That's what she wanted to stress, even in a piece about a woman who cheats. So I just think she's someone we should pay more attention to. Um, she said this funny thing about women's liberation, which shows you the, the brilliant flippancy of what she's saying, right? Because they're proclaiming women are brighter than men, 
but that should be kept very quiet or it ruins the whole racket, right? So wait a minute, we are smarter than men. Did, I, did you see how I just told you that without telling you that? Aha, uh -huh. right, so she's pretty brilliant. Um, and I think we don't teach her enough. Lois Weber is quite brilliant. She used her films. She was a director. We know her more as a director, but she was a writer of many of her early films. And they were all about something she wanted to change. And Shoes is a piece one of my students studied last year, and it wasn't even on my own viewing list. And then she, she berated me for that. So it's on next year's viewing list. Um, because it's this lovely piece of activism, and in this case, we're talking about poverty. It's a story of a young girl whose shoes were so torn apart, she ends up becoming a hooker to buy enough money to feed her family and to buy a new pair of shoes. And in this case, we had this beautiful line about the flower that didn't have a chance to bloom, right? And it's because the worm of poverty had entered and the folded bud and spoiled it. And that's a beautiful piece of dialogue to, to hammer in her point. And then look at how beautifully, again, as a director and experimental in the early days of film, using this hand of poverty. Just think that's really quite fun. So again, someone who don't know a lot of, I also, don't care about the dialogue and suspense that much, but people talk about D.W. Griffith and all the brilliant shit that he did. She, she did a split screen before anybody knew you could, right? So she was definitely a director that should be paid attention to and a writer. Um, people forget that before Madonna had sex in front of everyone, <laughs> Madonna was arrested for a play called Sex, right? She was arrested and she used the arrest as propaganda to get more people to buy tickets. And so, again, an example of the kind of stuff she wrote. She would often say, she wasn't a writer, she was a performer. But the funny thing is, when she died, they found, you might remember if your grandmother had recipe card boxes with little three by five cards and they would have the family recipes in them. She had boxes and boxes that were her writing jokes. She wrote jokes for hours every day, like, like a late night TV show writer staff will write tons of jokes and pick the top good ones for the monologue at night. She had tons of them. She was such an inveterate writer, again, that we don't think of. And she was telling us things, right? Marriage is a fine institution, but I'm not ready for an institution. Which is an opinion about marriage for women in the debt, right? But by being funny, we slide in our actual opinion. Frances Marion, we also talk about a lot. I didn't pull too much of her dialogue, but I like the fact that in all her pieces, she chose to make a statement. And in this case, she wanted to show how bad the prison uh, industry was in the United States. Still is, by the way. Um, but she also took that moment to go, um, I'm sending a nice man to jail for driving while drunk and killing someone. This is long before we had laws against that in the United States. She was taking that moment to add that truth to that character. And I think that's a very, very interesting thing. Years later, I was on a show called 21 Jump Street, and we had an actor who wouldn't show up for work because he was on drugs. And so they fired him. And the next season, they had to give a reason why he was gone. And to make it worthwhile, we said he was killed by a drunk driver. So still using that storyline to remind people. And it also happened on the West Wing. That's how they killed the secretary to the president. So, you know, writers using their dialogue, their stories. The problem is when you use that medium, at least in the United States, you sometimes lose some of your power. So mentioning Francis Marion, I'm thinking about the Writers Guild. And those early writers who started the Guild were then punished for that and started to lose their contracts because, of course, the studios didn't want guilt. Um, so Dorothy Parker, who was also instrumental in starting the guild, had this to say about letting the academy take care of writers. So it's all about saying it in a funny way and making people think. Um, we also have the very first female president of the guild was Mary McCall Jr. And she was a writer. She wrote mostly what would be called B serials today. Um, one I'll get to in the next slide is the Maisie series. But I think she's particularly important in now using her words in public. Uh, when Salt of the Earth came out, it was written by three communist blacklisted writers and producers. Uh, they, the studios were not going to let Paul Jericho have his credit. And she knew that if, they let, if she let one person get away with that, then they would run rush out over the union. So she did that, which blacklisted her. <laughs> so she used her words to save one writer, and of course it harmed herself. But she had that personality. This is the attitude of Maisie in these movies. She's a very adventurous young woman. Um, she was hugely popular. It's so amazing that she sort of disappeared from popular culture. But I love the whole concept. I understand two languages, English and double talk. Right, so she's speaking to a man in that case. Um, most people know Lillian Hellman, again, for all the things she wrote, uh, Children's Hour and things like that. But this is what she said when she was brought to the um, HUAC, the House on American Activities Commission, and they wanted her to name names. And she's one of the few people 
who officially didn't get blacklisted by them. She was too famous. And also, she got away with it by saying this. Like, that was her response to, I'm not giving you any names right now. And they didn't know what to say back, which is pretty interesting and could be compared to the debate we had the other night where somebody said things the other person couldn't answer because they weren't smart enough. Um, a lot of these women are covered in this book that came out a few years ago, Broadcast 41. Of all the people who appeared in red channels, which was the list of people you couldn't hire, 41 of them were women. And we often just hear about the Hollywood 10, and they were all men. And that's fine. They all did a beautiful thing, and I'm very proud of them. But there were 41 women who lost their work at this moment. And some of them had to do different things, like change their name. Um, in this case, before that happened, Gertrude Berg was on television, and she did a show called The Goldbergs. It was the first Jewish family represented on television. She was the most popular, second most popular woman in America underneath Eleanor Roosevelt in polls taken. That is how big she was. And she won two Emmys for her work on this program, and it ran for 20 years. The problem was her lead actor, who played her husband on the show, was blacklisted, and he was in the Communist Party. That shouldn't be a reason you don't work, but it was back then. Um, and she refused to fire him. So again, using her words as the writer and producer of the show, refused to let him go, and the studio the network canceled her show. He committed suicide two years later because he couldn't get any more work because nobody else would take that stand except her. So I think she's somebody, and she fell out of history, right? 20 years, the number one show in early television. Nobody talks about her anymore, which I think is amazing. Joan Scott was married to one of the Hollywood 10, Adrian Scott, and so to get more work, she went back to her maiden name and worked as Joanne Court. So no one knew that she was the same person because she was gray listed, right? Your blacklist was people who you couldn't hire. The gray list was like, it'd be nicer if you didn't, right? But we're not putting their name down anywhere, but it'd be. And usually you were married to someone, you were related to them somewhere, or you'd work with them, and they might have been a partner at some point. So I think she's an important person. And even in then doing television work, it's something as simple as Lassie, she was making sure that her statements were embedded in this cute little family show, because this is about someone accidentally irresponsibly starting a forest fire, which is obviously an important thing to talk about. She wrote about environmental issues in Lassie, ladies and gentlemen. So even though she lost her larger platform, she kept her words and her point of view in this smaller platform, which I think is pretty cool. And then I'm going to jump ahead because there's so many people. But I, I can't not talk about Susan Harris. I'm doing a, a book on the work of Susan Harris for Anne, uh, who's here with us at the conference as well. And Susan was brilliant. Uh, Soap is the first show on television that had a fully gay character, and that was played by Billy Crystal. And we're talking about the late 1970s. That's nearly impossible to think of. This is long before Will and Grace was on television. And she was an amazing writer. She didn't want to produce. She happened to marry a man who wanted to produce and couldn't write. The joke is that he told a friend he wanted to produce television, but he wasn't a writer. What should he do? And his friend said, marry a writer. <laughs> so he did, and they were together until his death. Uh, so it was a very happy marriage, and they, he produced all her work. Um, I wish I could show you this, but I could tell you to look at YouTube. Harold Gould was an actor who'd been around since the Yiddish theater and vaudeville. He played Rhoda's mother in the 70s. He was in The Sting, um, brilliant actor. He is in this episode with Jody was going to, um, Jody tried to commit suicide because his male lover didn't want him anymore. And Harold Gould gives this lovely like four minute monologue about how as an older man, he lost his first wife, then he lost his second wife a dream he never thought would come true. And then he thought, well, I'm done, right? I should just die, it's okay. And he had a heart attack. And he thought that was God telling him he should, he's done now, right? That you'll never get more than two loves in your life. And then he woke up after the doctors gave him the pacemaker and he thought, maybe it's worth staying. And he's trying to feed that to the young boy who thinks after losing one love, his life is over. It's the most beautiful thing you should see in that. <laughs> I would play it, but I'm not going to use your time. Then, of course, she's most famous, The Golden Girls, which traveled all over the world and has been made in other countries. And most of the things she said on The Golden Girls were about how we treat older women, right? The most invisible women in our society. We don't take them seriously. And so she was really using her pulpit, and I will call it a pulpit, to remind people of that. And I um, happen to love the B. Arthur character, Dorothy. I think I always thought I was B. Arthur until I realized I wasn't that tall. So I, I guess I'm actually Estelle Getty. But um, she always used her to make very, very important points. Um, one of them was based in her own life. She had 
uh, she was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, which was one of those things that doctors would look at a woman and go, you're just whining. You wanted a man to talk to you, so you made an appointment with the doctor. You don't really have a thing, right? And Susan Harris was a rich woman who was being ignored by her doctor. So she wrote an episode about it. <laughs> because the power of writing a TV show is you had this constant chance to keep doing new work and you know stay relevant, basically. Um, so again, you could look this up on YouTube, but it's the most beautiful piece by B. Arthur. She's confronting the doctor who ignored her after another one told her what she really had. And it's cute because his wife is like, who is this lady? And then when she starts to talk and explains that this guy ignored her, he's like, she's nobody, honey. And the wife is like, shut up. <laughs> and then the wife allows Dorothy to continue telling him what he did wrong, which all boils down to, um, I hope if you ever get sick, you have a doctor who is better to you than you were to be. So it's this tirade that ends in this very poignant piece. And I think that's what Susan Harris did best. Um, another person that I always think is really, really important is Linda Bloodworth Thompson. She did a show called Designing Women, and she had another show called Evening Shade. She was the first woman to have two half an hour comedies on CBS at the same time. She was a powerhouse until Les Moonves, who was the, had then took over CBS, um, canceled all her shows. And she had a seven-year contract to write for CBS continuously. And he would let her write pieces, and he never greenlit them to go on television. He hated her, and you probably have read that he turns out to be a total and complete jerk. <laughs> um, thankfully, she said, never sexually harassed her, but mentally harassed her by letting her work on a project that would never see the light of day. And since she had a contract, she couldn't sell it to anyone else. So he basically shut down her, her career for seven years, which amazes me. But um, in her show, and again, there are many clips online, um, she talks about, she uses Di the Dixie Carter character to really bang the drum about feminism and all these issues that are going on in the day. Um, I like this one pretty much. Um, she's yelling at men who are saying, we shouldn't uh, elect a woman. Isn't this interesting from the early 80s? Shouldn't elect a woman. They don't know how to run things. She's like, well, by the way, <laughs> who's been in charge all these years? And by the way, it hasn't been childless cat ladies, just so you know. Um, <laughs> she would have a great time writing television today. Um, and this is a long one, I know. But this is Annie Potts talking to someone who, this is at the height of the AIDS uh, um, issue in America, around the world, that um, this woman is like, oh, it's, it's nothing, you know, you have to think about the reality of this, that you can't teach sex education because you're telling children to have sex. She's like, no, I'm telling them not to die. I need them to understand how to protect themselves. And I think it's just an amazingly powerful, and this is a comedy, right? But she got away with it because, and someone's talking later about casting and the blending of actors and, and writers. I think this is Dixie Carter and Linda Bloodworth Thomason. I could do a whole half an hour on the two of them, and I really suggest that you take a peek at anything um, from this show online. They're all so powerful. And this is her own opinion about her life um, and what happened to her after the Les Moonves issue. So she's somebody I obviously admire very much. Um, obviously, Shonda Rhimes. We can't, not talk, we can't talk about TV and women writers without talking about Shonda Rhimes. Um, and this is a line she gave Meredith Grey, which I think is very beautiful. So she's always talking about the philosophy of life, and she's using her characters to bring her philosophy forward. Um, and that's why Grey's Anatomy is not a soap opera. It's a drama about the lives of doctors who have life and death in their hands every day, but since it's majorly stars women, people call it a soap opera. <laughs> but it's such an important drama with such an important message for women. Um, I think this is a beautiful piece that she gave Meredith Grey. And this you can hear Shonda Rhimes' voice talking about trying her career in television, right? It's about trying to live the dreams you have. It's better to try and lose than not to try at all. And yet she fits this philosophy so seamlessly into her characters, and it's beautiful. And then I wanted to make sure we covered Dr. Miranda Braley, who had, and Shonda has said, had she done the show a few years later, her lead character would have been a woman of color but there was not, it would not have been accepted in television at the time. So she went with the Meredith Grey character and she made Miranda a very strong female character as well, right? And saying some very important things. And this is kind of the beginning of talking about feelings, which again makes people think it's a soap opera and a girly thing. But Inside Out 2 taught us that everyone should talk about feelings because our, our society needs it. Um, so um, these are many of the women, and I could go on, but 
exactly, I knew my time would be short. So I would just like to remind people as they're thinking about who we're teaching and who we're, whose work we're bringing to the forefront, to remember to include the ladies. Thank you.